Throughout history, men and women have coexisted despite their differences, but sometimes it's hard for them to truly understand each other. In response to this, feminist groups have sought to create their own societies without men, ranging from boarding houses to all-female communes. Martha McWhorter, a happily married woman, started an all-female Bible study group in 1860 where abused middle-class housewives found solace and support. She encouraged these women to confront their husbands about their marital issues and, if necessary, withhold sex as a form of protest against abuse, marking the beginning of the women's empowerment movement. Around a decade into hearing countless stories of unhappy marriages, Martha McWhorter had divine dreams that inspired her to create a community where abused women could escape and live independently. With the support of her husband, they opened up their spare rooms to those seeking refuge, who in return helped run their general store and did household chores to contribute towards their rent. These women also found jobs in town to support themselves and their children, forming a close-knit group that lent money to one another and eventually pooled their incomes to purchase a boarding house known as the Belton Women's Commonwealth. Women in these all-female communes not only found power and freedom, but also had the audacity to dream bigger. They started small businesses, like laundromats and boarding houses, which not only made their lives more efficient but also challenged societal norms by defying expectations and becoming entrepreneurs. With their newfound success, they were able to purchase farms and support their employees, creating a sense of value and appreciation that only fueled their determination to work even harder. Living in the women's communes allowed women to have set work hours and share household responsibilities, giving them the luxury of free time. They used this time to learn to read and write, as well as trades typically reserved for men. Their love for reading led to the creation of the first public library in Belton, Texas, which still exists today. There was significant backlash against the Santificationist movement, with many blaming Martha McWhorter for the rise in divorce rates in Texas. When two Scottish brothers threatened the women's commonwealth, a mob of women defended themselves and taught the men a lesson they would never forget. During the Sanctificationist movement, women were encouraged to remain celibate in unhappy marriages and were not allowed to bring men into all-female communes. While the no-sex rule became controversial in more modern times, many hardcore female communes still adhere to celibacy. In the 1800s, some women who lived in these communities were secretly lesbians, finding solace and happiness together. In later communes, women became more comfortable openly admitting their sexuality, but these communities still welcome women of all sexualities. During the 1960s and 70s, all-female communities known as women's lands emerged in remote areas, hidden from mainstream society. These self-sustaining communes provided an escape from the patriarchy, offering a safe haven for abused women and a chance to live life on their own terms. Some of these communities were specifically created for lesbians, while others catered to women travelers seeking a safe place to stay. Today, these women's lands still exist, welcoming women of all races and religions, and relying on the collective effort of their citizens to thrive. The term women's land intentionally replaces the word woman to challenge the linguistic connection to a man and highlight the historical associations of women being seen as property. This linguistic shift is a way for radical feminists to assert their autonomy and reject traditional gender norms. In the 1970s, all-female communes provided a safe haven for abused women and their children. These communes embraced the idea of collective parenting, with kids being raised by a large group of aunties. The children, known as wild kids, grew up in a unique environment where surnames were replaced with wild to symbolize their connection to the wilderness and the equal importance of both parents. Some of these communes also practiced open and polyamorous relationships, leading to some children not knowing their biological parents until they were older. Despite their unconventional upbringing, these hippie forest kids turned out to be pretty normal when they joined mainstream society. In these all-female communes, women are free to embrace their bodies without fear of judgment. 
Many of these hippie colonies from the 60s and 70s believe that women should be able to walk around shirtless without being sexualized by men, and even today, women attending all women events are encouraged to let it all hang loose. Female retirement communities still exist today, offering a solution for elderly women who face financial struggles after their husbands pass away. These communities provide a supportive environment where women can retire together, just like the original members of the Women's Commonwealth who moved from Texas to Washington, D.C. to spread their ideas. In the 1990s, the concept was revived by a group called Older Women's Co-Housing, who aimed to support each other financially and emotionally during retirement. These communes have a strict policy of only allowing cisgender women to join, as some feminists argue that transgender women should not be able to identify as women and benefit from the privileges of femininity without experiencing the struggles of being born and raised as a woman in a patriarchal society. This debate has led to the exclusion of transgender women from these all-female groups. Following the Nancy Burkholder scandal at the Michigan Women's Music Festival in 1991, a group of trans women formed their own festival called Camp Trans, with the motto, Camp Trans. For human-born humans. This group aimed to create inclusive events that recognized everyone as human beings, regardless of their biological or mental gender identity. LGBT communities, including transgender women, found solace in women's communes, as they provided a safe space for individuals who struggled to fit into mainstream society. These communes, which emerged in the 1970s, were inclusive of the entire LGBTQ community, with some members identifying as radical fairies and establishing sanctuaries globally. Living an all-female life can sometimes lead to resorting to anarchy and homelessness. In Oahu, Hawaii, a group of native Hawaiian women and their children run an all-female homeless encampment called The Harbor where they live off the land and trade goods instead of using money. After the controversy at Mitchfest, attendance at feminist groups supporting the LGBT community declined, as it seemed hypocritical to advocate for gender and sexual equality while excluding transgender individuals. However, the original purpose of women's communes has evolved significantly over time, with more options available today for women seeking refuge from abuse. As a result, all female communes have become less necessary and are now often exclusive, potentially leading to their eventual disappearance.